name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Archbishop Lefebvre was once asked how it was possible that so many churchmen, the majority of churchmen even, went along so readily with the changes in the revolution which devastated the Catholic Church some decades ago. And the one asking him, listen attentively to what this man would say. What is the reason? Modernism, certainly, you would expect. Or perhaps liberalism, the scourge, perhaps even ecumenism, the spirit of ecumenism, of watering down the, the truth of the the church, the Catholic Church, is the unique means of salvation. But the Archbishop answered in just one word. Tepidity. It's worthy of note that in the first generation after the ascension of our Lord, he is, through the Apostle John, addressing one of the very first bishops of the Catholic Church, that of Laodicea, and we know the passage well, where he tells him, because you are either hot or cold, I will begin to vomit you out of my mouth. But there's an interesting pairing. This lukewarmness is linked by the risen Christ speaking. It's linked with blindness. You are lukewarm because you are blind. Because you say, I am rich and have need of nothing. And you know not that you are wretched and miserable and blind. Today we have before us blindness. The blind man in the gospel. But perhaps even more remarkable is the blindness of the apostles. They can see, unlike this man crying out for healing, and yet there's a more distressing blindness, a blindness of heart, an inability to see what our Lord is plainly telling them. The Son of Man will go up and be spit upon and scourged and, and killed. And they did not understand. It was hidden from their heart. On a similar occasion, when our Lord tells them the same thing, Peter says, Lord, no, far be this from thee. And in one of the most, perhaps, shocking moments of the gospel, our Lord says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Speaking to you, the first pope, speaking to St. Peter. Because you savor the things that are of man and not the things that are of God. This blindness of the apostles comes from a savoring of the things of the man. In other words, a tepidity of the heart. A heart that is still rooted in a human way of seeing things, an earthly way. In short, a heart that's still rooted in the world and its spirit. He who loves the world hath not the charity of the Father in him. And so they're blind to this plan of the charity of the Father, which culminates on Calvary. And our blindness is the same. And if we don't realize it, it's because our blindness is that deep. We perhaps rely on our generosity. After all, are we not leaving all things to follow Christ? Behold, Lord, we have left all things. Words of St. Peter. Perhaps we rely 
beside those of St. Peter. And yet look what happens when God's plan of charity crashes in on his and all of the apostles' preconceived ideas of what it means to follow Christ. The shepherd is struck and they are scattered. I do not know the man. Peter would say that very night. It's not our good intentions. It's not our supposed enthusiasm for our Lord or even for the beauty of the cross that frees us from this tepidity, blindness. In fact, these are often the film which keeps us in this blindness of heart, this savoring of the things of man and not the things of God, which are so opposed, which are truly foolishness to us. So what can save us? What has the power to open our eyes, to free us from the blindness, the blindness which keeps us, steeps us in lukewarmness? What is it? Is there something we can do to be healed? Because it's of tremendous importance. And we are not free from it. Well, if we put ourselves in the desert on that really terrible day, when thousands upon thousands were being mortally wounded, it would have been complete chaos, terror. The Jews in the desert dying by the thousands with no hope. And at a certain point, the word begins to spread among them. Anyone who's been wounded, bring them over here. And they began to do that. And what was over here? Moses and a mysterious serpent fixed to a cross, lifted up high. And all those who had been stricken, bitten by these fiery serpents, which was, incidentally, a punishment for their murmuring, their savoring not the things of God. Bring them here, because God had told Moses, whoever looks upon it, having been stricken, will be healed. And so they brought them. But it wasn't enough to bring them. They would not be healed until they looked. They had literally to turn their gaze, fix their eyes on the cross and on this brazen serpent. And as many as did so were healed. Healed immediately. Healed from the, the venom of the serpents and perhaps more importantly still from the, the poison of their lukewarmness. Their inability to savor the things of God. It is exactly what we must do to begin to see, to begin to be free of our divinity. It's to look upon him who is a worm and no man, fastened to the cross. And after years of preaching, years of being an apostle, St. Paul had just one thing that he would preach. I preach one thing, Christ crucified. A stumbling block for the Jews, foolishness to the Greeks, but to them who believe the power of God and the wisdom of God. He held one thing before the eyes of these Christians, because he knew everything was there. There was a, a young German woman who had lost a friend in a car accident, and she was praying for the soul of this friend. The, the, the German lady, her name was Claire, and her friend who had just died was Annette. And one evening she was praying for her, and in fact Annette appeared to her. 
And Annette told her, Claire, stop praying for me. It's useless. I've been damned. And Annette proceeded to tell Claire a great many things. And she told her one thing in particular, which is quite remarkable. I'll give you just a little excerpt of their conversation. She's describing the state of the damned. And she said, All that is left for us is hate and torment. Here we drink of hate like water, even among ourselves. Above all, we hate God. And I will tell you why. The elect of heaven, they cannot help loving him because they see him unveiled in all his dazzling beauty. That gives them indescribable happiness. We know it, and that knowledge drives us into a fury. But the soul in hell can only hate him eternally with all the audacity of its ill will. Yes, hate him with all the strength of a freely made decision to be cut off from him. We make that decision with one dying breath. Even now, we would not wish to change it, nor shall we ever wish to do so. She continues, On earth, those who know God through creation and revelation can love him, but they do not have to. The believer, and it makes me furious to have to say, the believer who in his meditation looks upon Christ with his arms outstretched on the cross will end up loving him. We simply must gaze upon love crucified. St. Thomas, in perhaps one of the most beautiful lines of all of his work, is answering the question, was being crucified the most suitable way for God to save the world? After he makes it clear that one drop of blood could have done it, or even one act of love to his Father could have saved the world, why be crucified? Because man knows thereby how much God loves him, and is thereby stirred to love him in return. And in this love lies the perfection of human salvation. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, our Lord tells us today. We undertake this journey, which culminates in Good Friday. We undertake this journey of Lent. And we have a choice. A choice, a choice to remain in our <coughs> supposed generosity, our good intentions, our goodwill, our blindness, our savoring of the things of man, even as we rhapsodize about the beauty of the cross, or we can do what those Jews bitten by the serpent did in the desert, go and gaze upon the crucified. We can do what St. Paul would have all of his Flock do gaze upon the power of God and the wisdom of God and let it fill us with the charity of the Father. Without which charity, all that we do, even deliver our body to be burned, is nothing. We can remain in our human and comfortable way of proceeding 
or we can take the, take the word from the surprising place of a damned soul, the believer who in his meditation contemplates Christ with his arms outstretched on the cross will end up loving him. And once that love is there, everything is there. And until it's there, nothing is there. They will look upon him whom they pierced. Videbunt in quem transfixerunt. Please God, this, this prophecy, prophecy may be true. We've definitely fulfilled the, the second part. We have pierced him with our sins, with our lukewarmness, especially. Will we look upon him? Daily. It's uncommon in a Catholic home or a Catholic institution not to find a crucifix in every single room. There's a profound reason for this. As many as looking upon it will be healed. Will we give some time daily this Lent, should we say this life? How can a day go by of our life where we don't give some time to contemplating Love incarnate nailed to the cross. We must look upon him whom we have pierced. And so in concluding his message to this, this early bishop, who I will begin to vomit thee out of my mouth because you're neither hot nor cold, our Lord continues and he says, I counsel thee. My advice to you is this. To buy from me gold, fire tried. Gold, what is gold? It's the gold of charity. Buy of me gold, fire tried. That you may be rich. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Anoint your eyes. And we do this. We anoint our eyes with the ointment of this blood and water, which we see flowing from his side when we gaze upon the crucified. And in doing that, the scales will fall up from our eyes like they fell from those of St. Paul, of Saul. After which, he judged himself to know nothing among his people but Jesus Christ, and him crucified. It's by gazing upon the cross that we become rooted and founded in charity and become able to comprehend with all the saints the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, which St. Thomas says that those four things are the cross, the four directions of the cross. To know also the charity of Christ which surpasses all knowledge. Looking upon the crucified, that we may be filled unto all the fullness of God. His promise is infallible. Those who turn to my sacred heart, which we have open on the cross, if they are tepid, they will become fervent. If they are fervent, they will rise speedily to great perfection. Do we believe the promise of the sacred heart. So as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and with him our eyes. We beg of Our Lady the grace to have this single eye that she had. An eye fixed on one thing, the mystery of godliness nailed to the cross, who is to those who believe the power of God and the wisdom of God. And we beg with even more insistence than the blind man today who cries out all the louder, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. We beg because we know we are poor and blind and wretched. And in doing so, he will turn to us and say, what will you have me do? Lord, that I may see. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.